All right, so uh, this is the very final uh, push of the, of the conference, and uh, so uh, we can't cover ev everything. We can't, I mean, in half an hour with so many uh, people uh, in front here. Uh, I have asked them to use two to three minutes uh, for some opening remarks and uh, some conversation between them, and then uh, time allowing uh, the floor is open for a few for more questions from the audience. I thought of uh, opening the discussion by by posing two questions. I've already shared them with, with the uh, speakers. Uh, the title of the conference, Interdisciplinary Futures, actually suggests temp temporality. It's about futures. Now, looking at these futures from two points in time, in 1996, how did the futures look like when viewed from that point in time, and how do they look like when uh, viewed from today's uh, point of view? So how different are these two futures, as it, as it were? This is the first uh, question. I would myself say first that, on the one hand, it seems that the very same hopes and wishes are aired. Uh, we have heard a lot of that kind of talk. And the very same complaints uh, are being expressed. So one wonders how much we have learned in the, in the meantime. Uh, on the other hand, science policies are increasingly attempting to promote it, interdisciplinarity and, and openness and all the rest of it. And we have a growing uh, body of research on it. Now I wonder whether there is an, a sufficiently adequate interconnection between these two, research and policy. And I, I, I have my own doubts and, uh, and uh, sometimes disappointments about just uh, this uh, matter. So, so that's uh, the first question about the futures. These two futures, how do they compare? And uh, the second uh, general question Actually, we already had some of that uh, in the, in the uh, talk and, and the uh, subsequent discussion just a moment ago. Uh, uh, yesterday at lunch, uh, we had a nice lunch uh, 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 provided by the, by the uh, foundation. Uh, I learned about the emerging discipline of threat studies. Okay, uh, it, it might, might become a, a discipline in due time. So the question is about threats. Uh, what threats are there? Uh, so this is the second question, and it can be divided into two. Uh, not only threats to interdisciplinarity and openness, but also threats due to interdisciplinarity and openness. So interdisciplinarity and openness might have harmful consequences, and then I wonder what those harmful consequences uh, might be. What kind of uh, nasty scenarios uh, there are. Just about a few words about uh, threats to uh, interdisciplinarity and openness, etc. I mean, there are these good old ones that we have again, once again heard about uh, during these two days. Institutional restraints and uh, troubles with communication and, 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 and the rest of it. And, and then there are all sorts of misconceptions about interdisciplinarity and uh, mismeasurements of it and so forth. And these are, of course, uh, prevalent in the uh, science policy uh, circles. Uh, but I would like to put more stress on, on, on the second kind of threats, threats due to interdisciplinarity and, and openness. Of course, science policy itself, as, a, as I already suggested, is often based on superficial understandings even misconceptions and often not properly based on adequate research on the relevant details concerning interdisciplinarity and, and so forth. Then there are consequences, uh, possible consequences when interdisciplinarity and openness are combined with the culture of accountability, impact, audit, and, and all the rest of it. I mean, this is not at all self-evidently self only, only good for whatever science society, and so forth. There might be, and under, under these scenarios, there might be an erosion of standards of quality, or erosion of rigor, erosion of expertise, erosion of academic freedom and autonomy, erosion of the image of science as objective and neutral, <laughs> and thereby, as a consequence, erosion of the cultural authority of science, and maybe the, the epistemic capacities of science, uh, 
uh, ultimately. So this is about the uh, about the future of disciplines, uh, not only about the future of disciplines, but also about the future of discipline. Not only of disciplinarity, but also of uh, being disciplined, and and, and so forth. So. Uh, and I thought of asking uh, the keynotes to speak, uh, to, to give their opening remarks in the order in which they appeared in the program. And insofar as I recall, <coughs> Professor Wall Wallerstein would be the first. There are a lot of people in this room. And the fact that there are a lot of people in this room is uh, uh, a sign of success in one sense, that um, Presumably nobody came here because they think interdisciplinarity is a bad thing. So everybody in this room must think it's a good thing. The only problem is, of course, what they mean by interdisciplinarity ranges over a, a large variety, and what they mean by disciplines ranges enormously. Um, now, I have noticed, so in a sense, uh, Yes, the, the threats issue is very real, but the threats issue is then an issue which we haven't been discussing, uh, which is what is happening in the real world. That is to say, what, what is happening with the world system in which we live and so forth and so on. That we haven't been discussing. We've been discussing how to discuss it, but not discussing it, right? <laughs> and maybe we can't get further without discussing it. I, I personally think that. Um, now. What I've noticed here uh, is that some people are interested in discussing the intellectual problems of disciplinarity or interdisciplinarity, and other people are really interested in discussing the practical problems. How do you get the money to do it? How do you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, uh, those, are, those are two, they're linked discussions. There are, there are lots of inter relations between them, but they are two separate discussions. We might perhaps have had two separate conferences to discuss them. Then what I hear when people keep saying uh, they've got practical problems uh, is that the social sciences and the humanities are still considered inferior by some larger group to the hard sciences. There's a hierarchy. They've won out. They. Uh, it wasn't true 200 years ago, but it's certainly true today. Now, it may be less true today than 20 years ago, perhaps. It's hard to measure, but it's still true. And when, when, you, when you hear a discussion that only 4% of the, of, the, of the budget is assigned to social science and the humanities, that says something to you. It says something that 96% uh, that is, is assigned to somebody else. Um, now... Um, uh, for me, uh, 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 disciplines have three totally different meanings. One is, a, is an intellectual meaning. It's, a, it's an assertion of a, of, of, a, of, a, of a domain which has some kind of boundaries and some kind of justification. Uh, uh, a second meaning is that it's an organization we have been discussing a little bit about the relationship between the organization, a, a department of, of sociology or a department of history, and, 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 and the concept of it. And it's also a culture. And, and, and there's, um, uh, when I, I've attended a, a reasonable number of sessions here, and one of the things that struck me as I listened to people uh, talking about all sorts of different things is, I kept saying to myself about most people, yes, that's an interesting point, but why didn't he or she mention X? Or why didn't he or she take into account the criticism of Y? And then I realized it's really a very simple answer to that. One of the reasons is none of us can read everything. It's just, just not possible. <coughs> and the fact is that we are directed by some kinds of cultural givens to tend to read this and not to read that. Uh, and, uh, and we haven't discussed how one gets over that cultural constraint, which is very real and very important. 
Now, I think I'm going to stop here and let you move okay. on to others. Thank you. I, ca I can actually imagine two other reasons for not covering everything. Uh, one is that, that in 20 minutes <laughs> you just can't. And another one is what's uh, uh, characteristic of science in general. You need to focus. Sometimes it's good to focus on small parts of a bigger problem. Anyway, I think the next one is Biren. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I devoted very much of my time yesterday to discussing the history of the social sciences, and I did not that not for pedantic reasons, because, but because I think it matters the way we look at it. And I also think that for a long time, and that's why I emphasize so much the virtues of history writing in the open society, for a long time, social scientists tended to get their history wrong. Uh, they either tended to write it in a very Whiggish fashion, describing the recent achievements as a continuation of a very long tradition, whereas in reality, the social sciences have historically, at each of these five critical junctures that I delineate, de deno denoted and talked about, at each of those, social scientists have had to demarcate themselves relative to other competitors. In the 18th, late 18th century, very much to moral philosophy, in the late, but also a range of other, dis, uh, other scholarly pursuits, including medicine. In the late 19th century, it was very much a way of telling what sociol how sociology, political science differed from economics and legal theorizing and regulation. And it goes on like that. And in doing so, social scientists have often tended both to give a Whiggish history and to give a, an, an erroneous history that can lead us in a wrong way. In the, we had a discussion, I mean, I think in that respect, open society is very open-minded and very clear. The, its only competitor, really, in terms of diffusion and, and uh, at attendance at the period when it was published was <coughs> the new production of knowledge, which is, in a sense, traces the development that Stephen talked about now. But it traces that so we have a long-term transition from what they call mode one, disciplinary-oriented, to problem-oriented. But, of course, in a long-term perspective, this is a completely erroneous historical account. The fact is that this, what became the social sciences emerged out of engagement with social reality, social movements, engagement, and some parts of that uh, were institutionalized in universities, and often in ways that emphasized very strongly the scientific features in those, in those efforts. And we had a very nice discussion in one of the sessions now about French traditions, for instance, the strong physicist the admiration of physics in much of, friend of, the, um, of the exemplary French contributions, including Durkheim's. So the social scientists have tended at each point in time to demarcate themselves for something that went before, to repress part of their own history, and to construct histories that are very much often of a rather arbitrary nature. And that will lead you in the wrong way. And in the case of the new production of social knowledge, new production of knowledge, it led in a way that, to my mind, emphasized uh, the intervention, the often harmful instrumentalist intervention into the scholarly community. Now, Stephen te tells a different story. It's a story of the opening of the sciences, and that's right. <laughs> that, that is happening, and that's who could be against openness. But the other side of that is that you could perhaps also describe it as the reaction of the social scientists to an audit society, to transition from liberal to neoliberal governance arrangements. So a parallel to that in terms of institutional structures is the emergence of an increased em emphasis on assessments, on rankings, on strategies, instrumentalist strategies that emphasize areas which are in which a university is reasonably strong at a given point in time, but in practice that will lead to the to the negligence of other issues that might be ma much more important in long-term perspective. And it leads also, of course, in terms of employment and career prospects for early career scholars to increased uncertainty. So that must be faced and taken up seriously. Now, the, the report opened the social sciences, had a number of recommendations. I went through them yesterday. I won't repeat that today. I think we increasingly can see that joint appointments of faculty is becoming a reality. It was, in a sense, 
always a partial reality in the leading American research universe because of the matrix of department and organized research units. We can see also when it comes to early career scholars that there are measures developing that are relevant not for grad only for graduate students but early career scholars beyond that. And the emergence and the creation of the European Research Council is a very positive development, but similar developments do not exist on a similar scale in other parts of the world. We see the development of young academies, which means that early career scholars can articulate their demands. This has, to my mind, has an enormously beneficial effect on the development of the sciences generally, including the social sciences. And we can see the development of integrated research programs. Yet, in an overall perspective, I'm reminded of what the per then permanent secretary of the Royal Academy of Sciences said some years ago when we presented a report on universities and research for the f in the face of the future. He said, there are more and more scholar young researchers. They are better and better educated. They produce results of reasonably good quality, unfortunately with a relatively short best before date, and they pursue research on rather well-trodden paths. So we, I think we have to seriously think about this situation. And that means opening spaces where you can actually do the, the unexpected, the unknown, probes, things that do not fit into university presidents' uh, strategic programs and endeavors. Institutes for Advanced Study is one little spot of that type. There may be many others, but I think this is a serious concern, and I refuse to think of this version of neoliberal version of openness as a deterministic course that we just have to adapt to. I think it would be enormously valuable if institutions such as the Gulbenkian uh, Foundation, some of the larger foundations in Europe, including the Bank of Sweden Tercentenary Foundation, would think through some of these issues, would think through, for, for instance, is it inevitable that universities become more and more what Weber saw, the American universities saw already 100 years ago as what they call state capitalist enterprises. But I mean, even European universities becomes increasingly rare that a real scholar is the president and vice chancellor. I think that is not a happy development. In the US, it is to some extent balanced by strong academic centers. We should think about, you could think about whether the good features of an institute for advanced study could also go through this openness, that development. Could we create a virtual communicative center that also had some of the virtues of being in a locale that was open to the world at large, not a small elitist institution for the, for the West? And could we perhaps create a small version, exemplary version, on a global scale of the European Research Council, not costing billions and billions, but some tens, tens of millions of euros? We had something like that for the former Soviet Union, the INTAS, which actually did a lot of good with very small resources. That would at least set a standard. It's, matter, it's very important to set standards. Thank you. Historians always need, need more words. Yeah, yeah sorry, sorry. <laughs> Felicity. I think, I think my comments are um, separated into, I'll try and be very brief. I think they're five points. Um, so I suppose it's, it's already been mentioned, but the, the, the term interdisciplinarity is so polysemic and the difficulties that we perhaps have talking across disciplines are replicated as we talk about interdisciplinarity um, because we are using it to, to describe so many things, but it has also become an incredibly effective shorthand. So I kept on thinking, do we actually need this term anymore? Could we dispense with it? If we, if we had banned the use of the term interdisciplinary for the last two days, would we have lost anything? Or could we have had all those substantive discussions without that term? Um, and so I, I kept on thinking, who is now conjured as that poor disciplinary scholar who is never interdisciplinary? Um, and I was trying to imagine the, 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 the straw man or straw woman who, who becomes <laughs> this um, ever, ever more enclosed person who, who, would, who would never tick the box as being interdisciplinary on the grant application because let's face it, um, many grants now demand that you are interdisciplinary. Um, so what, is, what happens when that term um, actually becomes something that is um, perhaps having more functions instrumentally than intellectually? Second point, um, in terms of the difference of, of, of 1996 and, and 2016 or 17, um, my talk this morning, I, I suppose I could not tear myself away from 
from what, 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 what is happening um, now. And I completely agree that we need to think about the, the demands and the, the exigencies of the world today and how we as social scientists respond to that. Um, but again, I think going back to the, the concept of, of interdisciplinarity, the historicity matters. In 1996, to use the term interdisciplinarity meant sl something slightly different. It hadn't become as, as common a term. I mean, it has many, many histories, as we've heard from many speakers, but it wasn't as instrumentalized then as it is now. So I think that the promise of interdisciplinarity then and now looks slightly different. Um, point number three, I, I'm very struck by how um, all kinds of interdisciplinary projects can um, disrupt older patterns of, of power hierarchy, um, geopolitical power, um, social axes um, in terms of gender and ethnicity, um, junior and senior, some of the most exciting interdisciplinary research is undoubtedly be do being done by early career scholars. So there's that possibility for all sorts of things to open up potentially. Um, but then I started also thinking about how certain kinds of pressures on this term interdisciplinarity end up shoring up existing um, hierarchies and inequities. Um, so, and I think that more work could be done to, to try and tease apart where things are opening up and also where they are closing down. Um, point four, um, related to that, uh, in 1996, the term interdisciplinarity and the open, those terms were, were, were tied together in some ways. Um, and I suppose from my earlier comments that I've just made, I'm thinking about the need to parse the interdisciplinary from the open. And maybe is it the case that in some ways interdisciplinarity now is more of a problem in certain um, corners than, than a help? So does interdisciplinarity actually close more things down than it actually opens? Um, we could have a long, much longer discussion about this. Um, and in relationship to that too, I was thinking about the, um, you know, on the, and you were talking about how, how one might allow things like institutes of advanced study to become a more kind of de democratic or accessible to, to many, many people. If one starts from the other end, I'm always struck by how current, I mean, if you look at the precarity of academic labor now, in 2017 compared with 2000, uh, 1996, it is much more precarious, un undoubtedly. And also interdisciplinarity has actually been aided by that precarity. Um, if, if you look at how lots of interdisciplinary innovations are made, it's because people are forced to move countries for short-term, fixed-term jobs, which has extraordinary effects intellectually, epistemologically, but I think that sort of putting that together with, with what is going on socioeconomically is a really important challenge. I know that I think we're coming at the same Absolutely. question from yeah. different Absolutely. different points. Absolutely. And then finally, um, my last 10 seconds, um, I can't <laughs> help but, and maybe it's just because I'm in a melancholic frame of mind, but um, I still worry that th of the possibility of interdisciplinarity actually further marginalizing certain parts of the social sciences and humanities um, in terms of its relationship to the sciences. Thank you. <laughs> Stephen? Yeah. Well, I'll be very, very, very brief. <clears throat> My main observation is the difference between the way we used to talk about interdisciplinarity and the way we're talking at this meeting is it used to be about teaching, and even in the, the 1996 report, this was really about pedagogy. I, I didn't hear a single paper dealing with that in this conference. It's, that's a m massive transformation in the way we're thinking about uh, interdisciplinarity. And a, a comment finally about the threats. Um, as a journal editor of science, uh, social studies of science now for 30 years, I'm concerned about the breakdown of evaluative structures and the replacement of those structures by these metrics is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, the um, 
uh, good methods of evaluation or the, the ones that, that people are committed to spending time on uh, were associated with disciplinary structures, many of which had lots of problems, but nevertheless, uh, it was more or less effective. And I'm concerned that uh, we, we don't have a substitute for that and the level of uh, cooperation and commitment of people working to do the kind of evaluation and help uh, that existed in the past isn't there. And I think that's one of the reasons why we've got uh, science uh, quality problems. I think that's a major concern going forward. And I think uh, some of these problem-oriented interdisciplinary uh, approaches um, do, do threaten uh, uh, because they overwhelm the, the weaker evaluative structures that we now have. It sounds like these uh, short remarks by these uh, four excellent scholars uh, suggest that we should have another two days of uh, <laughs> proceedings right, right after this. So Saturday, Sunday, <coughs> where shall we meet? <laughs> All right, uh, do you want to comment on each other's? Uh, you already said something, but... Uh, Questions? Yeah, I mean, the original idea of just using two to three minutes uh, per speaker was not... <laughs> completely uh, disobedient people. Uh, so, uh, we can take a couple of uh, questions, comments from the well, audience. I just want to make one comment. Sure. One comment. One of the problems we have not actually discussed is in this precarity of academic posts, we, most, many of us, or most of us, still get our income from our position in a university, and a university doesn't pay everybody the same amount. So they start people at a low fee and they move up to a higher one. And there has to be some measure, some method of evaluating people. You have to get a promotion, in other words. And the question is, what in the present day system is going to guarantee a promotion if you don't publish in a, uh, in a specific area? kind of journal or in a journal or in something and you're just in, 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 in a digitalized world, are they going to accept that and promote you from assistant professor to associate professor to full professor to whatever, to whatever you call it? Uh, or if not, you know, will it just be uh, um, the guy at the top likes somebody who's younger and promotes him? Question mark. <laughs> okay. So what is the answer? <coughs> Comments or further questions? Olivia. Maybe I, I just want to say something about, first of all, that thanking, of course, everyone for their participation. And just to give uh, some information about the follow-up, uh, Uskale, I'm thinking that, first of all, we will make available the um, presentations of all our keynotes, uh, um, because they have been very generously videoed by the foundation. So soon we will send you an email with information about how you can access that, in that data. And uh, I, I would ask any of the keynotes who has not provided us with the, with a PowerPoint, if they can, we would be very grateful uh, to add that information. And perhaps can I challenge the panel to uh, write a few, half a page or a page on the reflections that you've just shared with us uh, so that we can use that as a sort of record of a closure because you have presented us with some tremendously clear <laughs> comments and messages uh, for, uh, for us to follow up. Uh, so I, I think that would be wonderful if you could do that uh, for us uh, and maybe send it to Uskeli who will marvelously package them for, uh, for everybody to share again. Thank you. So that was my comment. Okay. Uh, sounds like uh, there's an agreement that this is it. So <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. It was great.